please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Jennifer Barham Floriani. Thank you. honored to be here with you today, um, yes, all the way from Australia, and um, I'm incredibly best, blessed to do what I do. Most of my time these days is spent between time with my four boys, helping my husband run our practice. We have nine chiropractors and about 20 allied health practitioners. I adjust some people at home, but predominantly with my books, um, I'm blessed to be able to work with couples all over the world whether that's via Skype, email, telephone. And I feel, um, you know, that's such a joy and delight to be able to do that. And of all the wonders in my life, chiropractic would be the greatest because it's made me who I am. It's who I am as a woman, as a, a wife, a mother, a chiropractor, an author, a speaker. And it's, it's been an incredible upbringing. Some of you in the room may have had a similar nurturing childhood, having grown up as a chiropractic baby. And you know, by the time I was 14, I literally lost count of the number of personal development seminars and chiropractic seminars that I was taken along to. Is anyone else, can they relate to that? You know, what an amazing upbringing. And so I give thanks for that every day. And what I want to talk to you about today is that since I was tiny, I've been setting goals for this profession. And so we'll talk about that because I really believe that chiropractic can be and needs to be the leading form of healthcare for families around the world. But before we get into that, I just want to acknowledge you guys for two reasons. Firstly, for being here. You know, taking time away from your families, from your practice, from your study if you're a student, and making that investment in yourself to learn and to grow and that investment in our profession and our future. And I really appreciate that about you because I know it's a big effort to come to seminars all the time and stay inspired. So I appreciate that. The second reason is um, I think it's very hospitable of you to have had such mild, beautiful weather the last few days. For us Australians, you know, it's snowing where I come from at home. So it's a bit gloomy outside today, but that's all right because we're inside. So thank you for the wonderful weather. Um, but yes, Chicago is such a beautiful place. Now, when I was a couple of weeks ago looking on the internet of what is it that Chicago is famous for? What do you do in Chicago? And do you know what the first Google listing came up with? And it was from one of your famous journalists. And he summarized Chicago in three words. So it was Chicago, Windy, Oprah. <laughs> so I'm an Aussie. Does that, I don't think that means that Oprah is windy. I think that that's typically Chicago is windy. Is that right? And so it made me wonder then, what would that same journalist say as a summary about chiropractic? So would it be chiropractic, nervous system, quality of life? Chiropractic, uh, wellness, cradle to the grave. I'm thinking it's probably more chiropractic backs cracks. Would you agree? And so why is that? Why is it that journalists still have such a misinformed idea of what it is that we do? Anyone? I'm really good with audience participation. Anyone tell me? Yeah, because not enough of us are telling the story. We're not telling the chiropractic story. We're not talking about the power of the adjustment, the power of innate intelligence, the power of when we connect the mind and the body and what happens and what unfolds for that person's capacity. And how do I know that not enough of us are telling that story? Because simple statistics, one in two men, one in three females will develop cancer. One in six couples has a fertility challenge. One in three Americans are obese. One in 10 have diabetes. One in two children have allergies. 
one in four asthma, one in six developmental delay, I can go on, <laughs> one in 20 ADD, one in 38 autism. We've had a 300% increase in the use of EpiPens. We have 1,500 different autoimmune diseases. And so, I know that not enough of us are stepping up. And so I want to do something now. I need you all to stand up, have a little stretch out. What I'd like you to think about is our profession in 2015. I'd like you to think about your role as a chiropractor, CA, chiropractic partner, student. Think about your role. Now, I want you to look at your hands in front of you, and I want you to place your hands over your face, and notice how your view changes. Now, just keep your hands there, please. So, think of your fingers as your thoughts, and go back to thinking about chiropractic being the leading form of healthcare, you being the leading healthcare provider or voice for vitalism in your practice. And just think about what thoughts come up for you, what feelings are stirred. Now, for some of you, you might think, well, I'm too young to build a family practice. I'm too male. I don't have children. Some of you might be thinking, why do my hands smell? I need you to focus. <laughs> I don't want to know why your hands smell. So focus. Some of you might be thinking, well, I can't build a big family practice because I'm not Mr. Hotshot and we minimize ourselves. I don't, you know, I just don't take enough action. I'm not on purpose enough. And then Mr. Hotshot might be in the audience and he's thinking, yeah, I'm doing all that. I really am the leading healthcare provider. And if that's you, I challenge you. Why are there still children being drugged by their parents in your area? Some of you might be thinking about what it is that you do in your practice and be really proud of that, and yet think, well, our profession will always be second rate, though. You can pop your hands down and have a seat for me. So the purpose of that activity is just to remind us that our thoughts are incredibly powerful. They change our view of the world, and our thoughts create our belief systems, they impact our words, our actions, our relationships, the cells of our body. They impact our community, our profession, and all of the results that we get. And it's incredibly important that we learn or we remind ourselves to master our thoughts. And so as a group, we might be doing better th with that than a lot of people because a lot of us have an awareness about our thoughts. But in our weakest moment, in our weakest hour, I can guarantee you that all of us give in to that mental terrorist, that saboteur, and think we're not good enough, think we're not bulletproof enough to do that community talk. Think that we can't get out into our community and do all the things that we've had a vision for, and we let ourselves spiral down into that in our weakest hour. And so the remedy there as some of you are aware, is to really acknowledge and build confidence in the unique strengths that our profession offers, and we're going to move into that, but to also learn to master our thoughts. Because is it really an issue with an ignorant journalist? Is it our association that might be a fence-sitter, an insurance company that tries to tell you what reimbursements you can have? Is it the chiropractor in your area who overschedules? or who's a medipractor. You know, none of those things are the issue. It's not whether we should have insurance or no insurance, or prescriptions or no prescriptions. It all comes back to us and our own BS, our own belief systems and what we do about that, and whether we step up and whether we take action. So if I give you a few examples, you might have someone who's, you just get that feeling that they're working their way out of your practice, but you might not sit and have a knee-to-knee -knee with them and explain the benefits of lifetime chiropractic. Because do you know what? They might say no. They might say no to me. And then my CAs might laugh. 
And I won't ring that midwife that I've heard about because, well, you know, that's tough. I won't ask that GP for a coffee because he might be really intimidating. Or for the students or the CAs, you know, I might not talk to that mum about her child who's climbing up the walls because, oh, I just don't know what to say. You know, I'm not as good as whoever at explaining chiropractic. And we back away from our goal. And so, sometimes we also think about pregnant women as being really over the top, hormonal, emotional, intimidating. And so they might present with some kind of complaint, back pain, headaches, and that's pretty common because two-thirds of all pregnant women have some form of back pain because of the uh, physiological changes that go on for her. And so this pregnant woman's in your practice and you've seen her for a little while, you've been addressing her chief complaint, and you think, well, I'll just wait for the right time to have those conversations. I'll wait till she asks. I'll wait till we've built more rapport. And so you don't talk to her about the fact that chiropractic can increase her health and well-being or that chiropractic can help her with any constraint issues so that her baby moves well within the womb and that brain develops fully. You may not talk to her about how chiropractic can lead her towards having a straightforward birth and the important cascade of events that are so critical for the lifetime health of her baby. That seeding of that microbiome, how chiropractic can help with breastfeeding, help to relieve birth trauma, help fulfill neuroplasticity. We think, we'll get to that. And that pregnant woman thinks she's having her needs met and she stops care. And we lose her. Who does that serve to give in to our fears? It doesn't serve her, it doesn't serve her child, and it certainly doesn't serve the health of our planet. And so I don't ever want you to think of a pregnant woman as just someone with a chief complaint again. And I go to seminars and I hear chiropractors talking about that. It drives me insane. There's so much more that we can offer. Because all of a sudden, sorry, we have a pregnant woman who's taking better care of herself than ever before. She's trying to eat well, she's exercising, she's being mindful of toxins, and she may have a complaint. And so what it is that we can offer her is so different to what it is that she's going to get through the medical system. So she'll be going to the hospital, and they will be telling her that, well, it's safe for her to have antibiotics, safe for her to have a flu vaccine, They'll talk to her about the fact that if her birth gets too hard, she can have all sorts of drugs, epidurals. If it gets too long, then they've got all great um, staff and equipment available for her to have a cesarean section. And then all of a sudden she's told that she's overdue and she'll be recommended that her labour be induced. And so she'll go through this process her labour will be induced, then her labour will be too intense and they'll offer her an epidural. And then her temperature will rise and she'll get a temperature and she'll need to have antibiotics, so will her baby after the birth. Her labour will slow because of the epidural, so then she needs Pitocin to speed it back up. And then all of a sudden she's having a caesarean. She has a caesarean, her and her baby are separated, her baby receives the antibiotics, they miss out on that critical time where the baby moves through the birth canal and has exposure to such amazing diversity in bacteria that seeds the digestive strength in the immune system, that seeds the microbiome. They're separated, the baby doesn't get skin-to-skin -skin contact, which releases hormones for both the baby and mum, stimulates the immune system again. The mum doesn't get that release of the hormones, so all of a sudden that baby's being formula-fed lifeless formula fed. They go on, they develop colds and flus, they have antibiotics. They go on and develop eczema and allergies, perhaps have a cortisone cream. They go on and get ear infections. They go on with more allergies, self-limit their diet, develop uh, developmental delay or sensory processing disorder. 
our silence is betrayal because if we don't explain how chiropractic plays such an integral role in the cascade of events, then people don't know. And we set our children up to be vulnerable to all of these events. What I also want you to appreciate is that right now they estimate that if a child does not go through a natural birth process, if they are not breastfed, if they don't have the skin-to-skin -skin contact, then we set that baby up for a lifetime of non-communicable diseases. So we're talking about things like asthma, Crohn's disease, celiac, um, all sorts of diabetes, obesity. They estimate but that by the year 2030, across the world, we will spend $47 trillion treating these non-communicable diseases that our next generation will suffer with. And there's a lot of research that I can share with you on that. So please write this number down, 10,831. That's the number of babies born every day in this country. That's a lot of babies. And I believe that every one of you here, whether you're a chiropractor, a CA, a chiropractic partner, a student, can play a profound role in how those babies are nurtured during pregnancy, how they're born, how they're raised. Because you all have a circle of influence. And again, if we step up and we tell the story, we can turn those health statistics around. Please remember that while pregnant women may be emotional and hard work, they can be the Nirvana client because they truly are like no other person you'll work with. They are sponges. They are so desperate for information and guidance. And if you are competent and if you invest in them, if you educate and inspire them, they become your raving fans and they tell the chiropractic story and it goes on from there. My husband and I have trained probably 18 associates in the last 15 years and what I want you to know is this, is that it doesn't matter whether you've been in practice for six months, six years, 60 years, whether you have no babies or 10 children, what matters is that you have a warmth and a confidence and a competency about you that is palpable, that you're authentic, and that these parents who are operating from such a limbic part of their brain, you know, they're, they're hormonal, once they've had their baby, they're tired, they, they're stressed, they need to feel that you are investing in educating them. Okay. Right. So, I was doing an interview uh, a couple of weeks ago with um, one of the associations in Australia and they said to me, how do you feel chiropractic, um, or how will chiropractic be placed in the next 10 years? And I said, I truly believe there has never been a better time for chiropractic to thrive and to shine and to guide humanity. And the reason being is that more than ever before, People are searching for answers. They don't trust the current medical system like they used to. You know, people are not thinking of science as a religion anymore. They don't wait for science to sanction what it is that they try because their children are sick. And so if we can remember that there is a desperate desire that is growing and growing within our community for new answers, for a holistic approach, to the health challenges that our planet faces, then there has never been a better time for our profession. Health is the most searched Google search term there is across the planet. All parents, for parents, they are searching up health. They want answers. And so sometimes people feel like in our profession that, oh, you know, but there's just, you know, there's, there's tension within our, within our profession, there's antagonists working against us. Is it really the right time? And I started reading books talking about how do we have a mass influence? How do we change behavior on a large level? And there are a lot of books on that. And so I took great comfort reading from sociologists and biologists who talk about through the history of time, through the evolution of man, there have been patterns. 
And so there have always been patterns of great stability through humanity. And then that is followed by a period of staunch rigidity where there's a lot of compression on that society, which of course then leads to anarchy and an uproar. And we have an increase in mental illness, physical illness, violence, crime, social disintegration. And from there, a creative minority arise and they offer solutions to that civilization, to that point in time, offering solutions and answers. And that um, civilization evolves. And so that has happened time and time and time and time again through the evolution of man. And that gave me a lot of peace to think, you know, this is not the first time that we've felt friction, that we've felt like, you know, am I the one to really be a voice? It's happened so many times through civilization. And what it is important to remember is that that creative minority, they inspired and engaged other people. And I'd love you to think about who are the people in your practice that you can really invest in? Who are the people in your community that may not yet be clients or patients that you can engage and inspire and use them to amplify the influence that you have? Right. I'd like to tell you about Taylor. So Taylor was a boy who was having incredible difficulty at school and at home. And one day he was really distressed that uh, he and his teammates hadn't won at a particular ball skills challenge. And so he got really angry and he pushed over some furniture. And in doing so, one of the little girls fell over and she banged her head. And so the principal called up his parents to the office again and said, look, you know, this is another situation. We really need to address this. And so she said, what I would like to do is rather than, you know, pushing ahead with him seeing a psychologist, is I'd like to orchestrate two police officers to come to your home tonight just to talk to Taylor and, and to talk to you and see whether that has some kind of impact. And so that night, two police officers did come to Taylor's house and they spoke to him and they spoke to his parents. And one police officer said, well, yes, you know, Taylor definitely needs to, to be on medication. This, this is just, you know, it's dangerous for other students. And the second police officer said, can I offer a different perspective? Now, he wasn't meant to be working in that area that night. He'd been on call. And he said, can I offer a different perspective? My own son, 12 months ago, was really violent and angry, and my wife and I decided to put him on drugs for that. And we put him on Ritalin. And he said, you know, he went from being really loud and aggressive to quiet and emotional within a few months. And he said, and he was just so hard to reach. And he said, so we changed his school and we changed different things. And he said, and nothing seemed to help. And he said, and then one day I was at the school and I was just talking to this mum and she said to me, do you know what, last night I went to a talk at my chiropractor's practice and he was talking about behavioural issues. I wonder if you would like to meet him. And the police officer relayed how they went to his practice, how they started care for his child. And he said, do you know, within a few months, my son just seemed to be so much calmer and so much more present and happier. He said, my wife and I took him off his medication. And he said, 12 months later, I have never known my son to be so happy. He said, if I can offer you one suggestion, he said, it would be to find a good chiropractor. And so I then get an email from Taylor's mum, and they're here in America. She'd asked around about chiropractic. Someone had recommended my website. And in the subject line, it says, please help us. And she asks me to help find a great chiropractor for her son, and we do. And he's doing tremendously well. And so I sat for a few days in, in just gratitude for that policeman, for the chiropractor, for the parents involved. And then the next day, I hear about this boy in an area near us who's having all sorts of challenges. And he's moved from school to school. He's been on kitty cocaine or Ritalin for a number of years. And one morning, he decides that life's too hard. Life's too much. 
and he jumps in front of a train. He's 14, was 14, and he dies instantly. And so too does the innocence of all the children standing there, watching, waiting for the train that morning. And I sit there with those examples and I think, who am I not to speak up more about chiropractic? You know, I can do more. All of us can do more. And so I draw on, you know, stories like that to help me take action as often as I can. And remembering that chiropractic isn't a re universal remedy for ADD, for behavioural issues, for asthma, for colic, for anything. That's not what I'm saying. But chiropractic is a wellness enabler. And it's really important that we hold on to that and we share that story. So I want to talk a little bit about these health challenges that our children face and the slippery slope that so many of them are on and why is that and how we can talk to parents about that or why we need to talk to parents about that. So if two-thirds of all pregnant women experience back pain, what do they do in that situation with the health culture that they've grown up with? They take a drug, don't they? And so we've got research like this, if I can just have the slide back, that talks about most pregnant women take a drug during their pregnancy. And so what does that mean then for our children? So there's three main windows where we influence the gut, the brain and the immune access. And that's during pregnancy, it's post-birth and it's in early childhood. And the reason for that is that there really is absolutely no placental barrier. We know that with, without a shadow of a doubt these days. So everything that a mum puts on her skin, everything she breathes, everything she eats, passes through to her baby. What I find amusing here is that in the 70s, you know, pregnant women would put their feet up, they would eat cheese, they'd drink wine, and it was the time to relax, they'd eat for two. And now obstetricians say, no, 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 you don't do that, you don't eat for two, you don't drink alcohol, you know, try to refrain from alcohol if you can. Don't smoke, because we know that's not good for your baby. But it's okay to have flu vaccines, to have four neurotoxins. You know, it's okay to have antibiotics. It's just, it's madness still. So there is no such thing as a placental barrier. The blood-brain barrier does not fuse or close until about two years of age. And the central nervous system is incredibly vulnerable. The gut wall, if it closes, should close around two years of age. And the other reason that our children are so vulnerable is that they have such immature detoxification organs. So they can't break down a lot of the toxins that they're exposed to. So some of you are thinking, well, that's always been the same. That's how, that would have been the same scenario for when we were growing in our mum's uterus. And yet the difference is, what we know today is when they test the gut bacteria of children in the Western world within their first week of life, they have very, very low friendly or good bacteria. They have high pathogenic or harmful bacteria and they have low diversity, so not many different strains of bacteria. So they're already starting behind the eight ball. What we also know is that when they test healthy women and how much bacteria they actually have in their birth canal in about the month leading up to uh, birth. These are women who've lived incredibly healthy lifestyles. Their levels of bacteria and diversity are also incredibly low. And that's because of the toxic world we live in. The depleted soils, the deficiencies we have. So our children are vulnerable right from the word go. Now what we know is that a lot of these drugs that the pregnant women are told are safe have never actually been tested on pregnant women. So they say that they don't cause birth defects and yet 90% of them have never been tested on pregnant women. So when a pregnant woman has back pain, she takes a painkiller. Now paracetamol, there are a lot of big, big studies that talk about long term. If a baby is exposed to paracetamol in the womb, it sets them up for allergies and asthma later in life. That's a long-term ramification of taking painkillers in pregnancy. A short-term impact 
is that Tylenol, paracetamol, all of those deplete the body of glutathione. Now, glutathione is so incredibly important, and I just want to touch on it briefly because we have a predicament of people being depleted in it. Glutathione is the master antioxidant in the body. It protects our cells from damage, so we need that in our life. And it's involved with DNA synthesis, DNA repair. It's the maestro of the immune system, so it helps us create all those good immune cells that we need. And when we deplete it, we set ourselves up to be vulnerable. So if we take these drugs in pregnancy, what happens is we influence not only the mother's immune system but the developing immune system, but more importantly is glutathione is needed as the fuel for the developing brain. It's needed to myelinate the brain and the nervous system. So we have babies being born now who are very, very deficient in glutathione, so their nervous systems are much more vulnerable than another baby. And then we inject them with three times the number of vaccines that you guys may have had as babies, and we wonder how autism arises. And I'm not saying that's the sole cause of autism, there are a lot of factors involved, but as leading healthcare providers, what I'm getting to is what it is that we offer. So a lot of pregnant women find pregnancy overwhelming. They may take antidepressants. Research shows that when a woman takes an antidepressant during her pregnancy, then her child is three times more likely to develop ADD or a behavioral issue. So from hearing John speak, what I love about what he's reminding us all about is that when we have a subluxation, when it's not addressed, there's that constant impact on the hypothalamus. There's that constant stress cycle in the body. And so when a woman is pregnant, then of course she's going to be in that cycle. So what we offer with our adjustments is, yes, we can address biomechanical issues, so her aches and pains. But we can also help address the stress that she's under, so she's not taking antidepressants. We can help build her health and vitality. We can be a voice of vitalism for her. There's so many things that we offer. We help her baby move within the womb, which is incredibly important because when a baby moves in the womb, in the womb we fire up the primitive brainstem. That's how our babies learn. So when they're in a constrained position, when they're held tight awkwardly, they don't move around, they don't learn as they need to be. And so when there's different research, when they look at developmental delay and sensory processing disorders and plagiocephaly and autism, one of the, the causing factors for that is constraint in the womb. It's not the only cause, but we need to be aware of that because chiropractic offers some phenomenal techniques to help get those babies moving. For our uh, fifth pregnancy, I've had five very, very different um, pregnancies and births. This was Arlo, our last, and I was breech. And that was when I learned about my fascial release technique through Dr. Valone. The Lo uh, Logan and um, Webster technique also work incredibly well. So when you have constraint, not only does it mean that the mother will be uncomfortable with pain under the ribs and into the pubis, it will influence her birth outcomes. Because if there's constraint in the ligaments and the, t the tissues, that baby is unable to move into a good position and put even pressure onto the cervix. But obviously the other impact then is that that baby's not moving and firing up its brain stem. So when that child then comes in as a new patient with plagiocephaly, I want you to be thinking about how that may have started as constraint. To use this information as you know, your initiative to be talking to pregnant women about the power chiropractic offers to keep her baby thriving in the womb and preventing this. These are just some quick photos for you. So you can see here, this woman is in quite a constrained position. Her abdomen is held really, really tight. Often women who have constraint are ex-runners, uh, personal trainers, gymnasts, people like that with really great tone. And this is post-adjustment. You can see with the little heater here how much more relaxed her abdomen is. Okay. Um, these are some more pictures of constraint. So we've got pre-adjustment and post-adjustment. So here, you've got this one here held in a constrained position. This is just after the adjustment. Sorry, there's been a mix-up there. I'll go back. Um, 
And then this one here is a week later. See how relaxed and beautiful that abdomen is? Okay. Another stressor for our children is ultrasounds. And women are told that it's safe to, you know, often have four and five and six ultrasounds, if not more, during their pregnancy. And what we know is that the primitive brain of all mammals develops in the same way. So it develops in a grid-like pattern. And this is great research that shows that on day six, when we, when we subject these, these mice to ultrasound, it displaces the neurons, it changes the patterning of their brain development. And so this um, gentleman who did this research talks about how ultrasound exposure is an environmental factor directly contributing to the exponential rise of autism because we're impacting how that brain develops. Another stressor is when we have an epidural in labour, the impact of that post-birth um, can be a decrease in tone, in muscle tone, jaundice, it impacts breastfeeding, it impacts sensory motor uh, responses. We know that with an epidural, yes, it decreases pain, but it slows down labour, so inevitably then a mum's having Pitocin. This is great research um, that talks about that Pitocin will cross that blood-brain barrier and that when they did research on children whose mothers had had Pitocin during their labour, children with, with ADHD were twice as likely to have been exposed to Pitocin during their labour. Now, some of the explanation around that is that it influences the oxytocin receptors in the limbic part of the brain, which is where we govern our behaviour. Another explanation is that when we have Pitocin, it makes the contraction so intense that we then put risk, our babies at risk of not getting enough oxygenation to the brain. These are all stresses that happen all the time. And if we can be talking to pregnant women, whether that's in an extended visit, so in our practice, we do an extended visit every trimester. So the girls make a slightly longer appointment time, either just before lunch or just before the afternoon session starts, and we get them, the couple to come with any questions that they may have. Okay? And there are lots of resources that you can use with that couple. You don't have to have all of the answers. In that third trimester, we get the partner to come if he hasn't come to the other ones, and we go through techniques that can empower him to participate in the birth as well. We run workshops, okay, so pregnancy workshops. Um, two of those, one during the, the main part of pregnancy and one in the lead up to the birth. We talk about things like we've already said, how toxins will pass through whatever the mum is exposed to. We talk about how through breastfeeding, toxins, up to 20 to 70% of all toxins that that mother has siphon off in the breast milk. So does this mean she should use formula? No, of course not. You know, there's so much research about the benefits of breastfeeding, but there's information we need to convey to talk to those mums about how they can build up the digestive strength of their baby, how could they can help toxins move through safely through the body. It's important to talk about the spiral effect. So there's a lot of couples who think, well, if labour gets a bit hard, then I'll, I'll, you know, I might have an epidural. And helping them to understand that what that means is, is that an epidural, yes, will decrease the pain, but it will inevitably mean more intervention, more of an instrumental birth where that baby will be subjected to birth trauma, which will impact breastfeeding. That baby will be subjected to antibiotics, which are very caustic on a vulnerable gut. Most likely babies who've had an epidural will develop colic. So sometimes, even though it seems like a great idea you know, to have an epidural, this is what you can be saying in a workshop, and I get it and I understand that it's really important as your healthcare provider to just play out for you what it is that can happen long term. Okay. So has anyone here ever had a fight with their beloved? Raise your hand. Yes, all of us. The reason, anyone who doesn't have their hand up is a liar. <laughs> okay. So we've all had a fight with our partner. Who here, after you've had a fight, has realised you were wrong? Men, put your hands up. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and at that point, did you go, yes, 
that was a great opportunity for me to demonstrate my wrongfulness. No. So it's important when we're trying to influence and communicate with great impact to be mindful that everybody has different references around birth, around parenting, and sometimes as holistic healthcare practitioners, we can live in a bubble. And it's really important that we be vulnerable, we uh, exude warmth, and we try not to make anyone wrong. Particularly because they don't have the wisdom and the knowledge that we do. So if you're gonna do these um, extended visits, these workshops, which I really encourage you to do, again, because pregnant women are the Nirvana client, if you invest in them, you invest in the future of your practice, the future of your community in our world. And so just being mindful of making it safe for them to explore the smorgasbord of options that they have and putting you in a position of being their leading healthcare resource, someone who's gonna give them the pros and the cons, not make them wrong, but lead them. We all have 165 hours in a week. I'd really love for you to think about how you could use more of those hours to step it up, to take all of those procedures and things that you've got in place and make more happen with your team, take more action, tell the story more. So chiropractic influences dystocia. Williams' obstetrics textbook talks about how um, Sorry guys, that time is not really working, if someone wants to just get me clear on that. So the three main causes for dystocia are insufficient or ineffective contractions. So what is it that governs the uterus? It's the nervous system. Another cause for dystocia, or abnormal or a long birth, which is what dystocia is, is abnormal alignment of the pelvis. We address alignment of the pelvis. Another cause is the presentation of the baby how the baby's aligned. Chiropractic addresses the three main causes for abnormally long or difficult births. Okay. This is interesting. The Canadian Medical Association has written recently in their journal that if a baby does not go through the birth canal with a natural birth, isn't breastfed like we've already talked about, it sets them up for inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, allergies, and asthma. I'm not making this stuff up. There has never been a better time for us to be guiding humanity on how to foster and preserve the health of our future. So what happens is, in the womb, a baby is held in a type two immune state to protect them from the outside environment. Normally, with that type of birth process, with breastfeeding, exposure to the world, they switch to a type one immune state, which is a strong um, form where they develop their immune system from there. The next one, thank you. The next one is where they, if you just go back to that slide for me, if they uh, don't do that, they stay in a type two state where they're highly reactive to everything. Okay, so I'm just going to skip ahead a few here. Sorry about that. Okay. So this is a graphic that I use a lot to talk about that there's so many stresses that our children face, physical, chemical, and emotional. And we talk about that the chiropractor, the, the adjustment helps to address all of those stresses. So you may have a parent who's wanting to put their child on eBay because they have colic, and helping them to remember that we're partners. We work together to address the subluxations, but we look at, in that environment, what may be contributing to that colic scenario. We can't say that the body is clever sometimes. We can't say that the body, you know, grows a baby, heals cuts, but then if we're constipated, then the body's not that clever. And it may be that they've been feeding their child bum glue all day, you know, with bread and pasta and all of those things. So getting them to look at the environment, empowering them. Okay. Chiropractic is incredibly important, like we've already said, for neuroplasticity in those first two years are when we need to be addressing that. Chiropractic has a huge impact on the nervous system. And what we do in that scenario is we unravel 
the powerlessness that so many parents feel when they have a sick child. So there is quite a lot of research already that talks about how the adjustments build the strength of the immune system. This one here, um, and I can give anyone this research, talks about how we connect the mind and the body and how adjustments improve the brain function in, in all areas of the brain, particularly in the areas that help us to think clearly and to sleep well. Right, what I want to leave you with now, sorry, that last slide, having PowerPoint issues today, is basically to remember that what we offer as a profession is so profound and unique. No other profession helps pregnant women to address the challenges that they face from a physiological perspective during pregnancy. No other profession helps them overcome the emotional challenges, improves their health and well-being. No other health profession helps to keep babies moving in the womb and remove constraint, helps those babies to thrive, helps women move towards a natural childbirth, which sets up that microbiome for a lifetime of good immune strength and digestive strength, which are so important. We have so many unique strengths that we offer. We're safe, we're effective, and you guys, I genuinely believe you are all leaders. You all have the skills and the knowledge and the wisdom and the brilliance to be stepping up and sharing that chiropractic story. With 10,831 babies born every day, and the time that we have in our weeks to inspire and create and amplify our influence that we have in our community. I would love you to remember that you are a light to the world. You are a catalyst for change. There is so much that we offer, and there has never been a better time for our profession to shine. Just like the universal intelligence knows how to hold the planets in our galaxy and keep them spinning in the tides, all of you have been called to serve for a reason. And I truly believe that you are all giants. You all have that capacity. If you can quieten that mental terrorist and hold on to mastering your thoughts and realize that you are enough right now to step up and do everything that you can within your power, because parents need that. They are desperate for your guidance. And I know that from the work that I do, and I am honored to work with all of you and to be on this journey with you. I love and appreciate you, and please just do more. Thank you.